Welcome and thank you for stopping by Sheila's Audiobooks and I am Sheila. This recording is coming from South Texas. All stories on this recording are in the public domain for United States copyright law. These stories were first published around April 1910. They are about Lord Lister called John C. Raffles the most brilliant among all thieves. He is the terror of usurers and money lenders, robs them of their possessions by his wiles, protecting beleaguered innocence and supporting the needy. Man of honor in all respects. He persuaded that many abuses, protected by law, continue to proliferate with impunity. Every effort is made to apprehend Lord Lister, called John C. Raffles, the most brilliant of thieves. Reward, £1,000 sterling. Lord List of the Diamonds of the Duke of Norfolk by Gert Matchell and Theo Blakenzy. The Diamonds of the Duke of Norfolk. Chapter 1. A Crazy Piece. Are you quite sure you have the secret password? Charlie Brand asked his friend, Lord Lister, who was just letting his servant help put on his heavy fur coat. The Lord laughed. Don't worry, Charlie. Things are okay. By connecting my telephone wire to the main line at night and thereby establishing an intermediate connection. I have had the opportunity for 14 days to eavesdrop on the conversations with the London and South West banks, and especially those which the management of the head office kept with the branch offices. And did you hear the password? Well, my boy. And how did it go on? I am simply burning with curiosity. Lord Lister stroked the dark moustache once. I have written to the various directors of 13 branches that an amount of £500 has been registered in their bank for a certain Samuel Rotwell. These letters I have signed with the name of the director of the deposit bank. And don't you think one of the bank managers will be suspicious? Not a question, Charlie. You know I deal in such matters with painful rigor. The inscription of the company, the stamp, everything is all right. And if a single bank manager may also have some doubts, the password will immediately make those doubts disappear again. A lackey appeared. Would you like a driver? The man asked. Charlie Brand made a defensive movement by hand. Not necessary. I will send myself. The footman bowed deeply and left the room. Charlie Brand now put on a long automobile coat, the fur of which had turned outward, so that he looked much like a polar bear. His face was almost completely covered by the large automobile cap. He went down the stairs, followed by Lord Lister, and fixed the red, elegant automobile. Slowly the handsome cart moved forward, chugging through the busiest part of London. For the deposit bank in Vauxhall, the vehicle was the first to stop. Lord Lister stepped out with a gesture of indifference. The doorman of the bank opened the door and bowed deeply. Lord Lister entered and made his way to the cash register. My name is Samuel Rotwell, he introduced himself. The chief cashier quickly took out the cash book into which the signatures were to be placed. In large, clear letters he wrote the words. Fred Harry Rolf Samuel Rotwell. Then, with a dexterity as if he had placed that signature a thousand times, he wrote an almost illegible scribble. The official looked at things with an inquisitive glance, nodded, then cast a quick glance at the distinguished young man, and then handed the new customer a checkbook. Mr. Rotwell immediately filled out one of the sheets for a hundred pounds. You'll be so kind as to pay me ninety pounds in notes and ten pounds in gold, sir, he said to the first bookkeeper, who complied with the request with a polite gesture. The visitor greeted politely, got back into his automobile and drove off. Charlie Brand laughed as he saw his friend come out of the couch. The same story was repeated at the deposit bank in Clapham. There, however, the first bookkeeper was more curious. You are planning great things, Mr. Rotwell? He asked. Well, replied Lord Lister with a smile, I'm going to the sledding in Windsor. I believe it will be very interesting there, for large sums are being wagered. So, replied the bookkeeper, handing Mr. Rotwell a hundred pounds. Lord Lister returned to his car. And so it went from bank to bank, to Bellum, Streatham, and so on. 
Before two hours had passed, Lord Lister had visited nine deposit-taking banks and had done the same thing on all of them. Entering the tenth branch, Charlie Brand stopped the engine, lit a cigarette, and waited. Ten times a hundred pounds is a thousand pounds, he calculated. All right, that's provisional enough for the plan which Lord Lister has in mind. If he didn't always give his money to the poor, he wouldn't be in every moment of money embarrassment, and such dangerous games would have to be organized. Just as Charlie Brand had finished his soliloquy, he turned in amazement. Someone had put a hand on his shoulder, and when he looked up reluctantly he saw the face of a man dressed in uniform and wearing a helmet. Inspector Baxter. It escaped Charlie's mouth. In sheer terror he dropped his cigarette and looked straight into the face of the dreaded officer. Yes, I am, replied the police inspector, in a friendly tone, you seem to know me already? Tell me. Who does that beautiful cart belong to? It is my master's, replied Charlie, now quite at ease. So, so. And who is your master? That's the owner of this motor car, Monsieur Inspector. Drums. You are a funny driver. But in order that we may go a little further, I will tell you in confidence that half an hour ago the director of the Depository Bank's headquarters has discovered that a hundred pounds has been paid to a certain Mr. Rotwell at all the branches. When he hastily looked over his books, he found that there is no man of that name in them at all. Who would have pulled such a rogue's trick? Say, isn't this car John Raffles's? Charlie Brand shrugged. Raffles? I don't know him, Inspector. If, however, you mean Raffles, the great unknown, I must say to you with great regret. But Baxter fully understood the driver's purpose. He wanted to keep Baxter talking, and by his talk prevent him from taking measures that, if Lord Lister came out of the bank house and saw Baxter, he would have every opportunity to escape. It's all right, Baxter said, beckoning two officers. These had very soon taken Charlie from his driver's seat and pushed him into a corridor. Then his beautiful polar bear coat was taken from them, as well as his car cap and glasses. We've had that bird in the cage before, said Baxter, looking at the secretary of the great unknown. Hold him, we must see what strange relationship this young man bears to Raffles. As Charlie Brand was being taken away, Baxter put on his coat, pressed the cap deep into his eyes, put on the glasses, and sat down in Charlie's driver's seat. Lord Lister just came out of the bank building. He was in an excellent mood, lit a cigarette, and, taking no notice of the driver, ordered in a curt voice. Taft ord. Inspector Baxter nodded. A broad grin twisted his mouth. Well. He started the engine. But it had not been wise of him not to have been able to keep his mouth shut, and he did not notice that Lord Lister for a moment held the car door in his hand and raised his eyebrows when he heard this well. Then he smiled and got into the car. Inspector Baxter started racing now. He raced through the city at breakneck speed and it was to his fortune that he was such a good driver. Nothing happened to him except that he bumped into a crew three times, killed one horse, ran over half a dozen milk carts and was written down by officers twenty-seven times. But what did he care? Inspector Baxter was simply folded double over the wheel, his face grinning with delight. He would gladly have killed a dozen more horses. He had Raffles after all. The great unknown was in his power. Raffles, meanwhile, leaned back, dead calm, in the cushions. If the engine hadn't made such terrible violence, Inspector Baxter would have heard the mocking laugh that Lord Lister let out. Of course there was no way to jump off the car at such a raging speed. Lord Lister would have broken his neck and legs. Pursued by bicycle cops, who wanted to confiscate this rash car, Baxter chased to Scotland Yard. The great building loomed in the distance. The inspector stopped abruptly sprang from the box, tore open the door, thrust out his revolver, and ordered. Get out, Raffles. You are my prisoner. The last words almost stuck in the inspector's throat. The officers, who had gathered around the car, drew back and held their noses shut. There was nothing but smoke in the car. Smoke. Thick, yellow smoke that gave off such a stench that Baxter could barely breathe. He fell on the snow and shouted aloud. Sky sky. I'm suffocating. Baxter had not yet been able to tell the officers what had happened, and they withdrew to allow the smoke to clear first. Finally the smoke thinned. Baxter regained the strength to get up and flew into the car.
but all he obtained was a gigantic cigar, which was as long as an upper arm. The cigar was made of steel, and from it flowed the smoke, which gave off such a pungent stench. But Raffles was gone, and Baxter hastily told how he had caught the master thief. But then he's gone up in smoke, Inspector, laughed the officers, who had come closer again. Baxter cursed. But what did that give? Raffles was gone. The latter had not been alarmed for a moment when he saw the car approaching Scotland Yard at dizzying speed. For such occasions he always carried one of the cigars with him, filled with a newly invented powder called aromatic. If a match or a lit cigar is held to this, the powder evaporates into dense smoke, and whoever inhales this smoke for a long time becomes unconscious. And as Baxter opened the car and flinched from the stifling vapor, Raffles had calmly stepped out the other side and walked away, unobstructed by anyone. Fifteen minutes later he had another automobile and drove to Brumley, to the eleventh branch. He believed that Baxter had only passed the bank building by accident, where he had recognized the car. Perhaps Charlie had betrayed herself through some carelessness. He didn't know what Baxter had told Charlie, who on his way to the police station had torn himself free from the hands of the officers and now waited in Lord Lister's house with a heavy heart palpitation for his friend to return soon. Lord Lister was a man who was not quick to give up his plans. He had now taken it upon himself to visit the last two branches, and even the great danger from which he had narrowly escaped did not let that stop him. So he entered the bank house, took off his fur collar, went to the cashier, and said. My name is Samuel Rotwell. But his hubris would be punished dearly. No sooner had he uttered this name than the bookkeeper shouted with all his might. Help! Help! Murder and manslaughter! Here is Raffles! In an instant the doorman had closed the doors and drawn their revolvers. Everything was confused. No one really knew what had happened as Lord Lister left the hall dead calm and made a desperate attempt to reach one more of the exits. But the porter held the revolver under his nose and said. No one may go out, sir. All you bastards. Can a decent person not enter a bank in London without a revolver being thrust under his nose? But the doorman didn't budge. I have strict orders, sir. But I know Inspector Baxter and six agents will be here in a minute. Surely it will soon give you your freedom back. Baxter was already there. Do you have him? He asked eagerly. Not yet. But he is here. The accountant recognized him. Raffles backed off so as not to be seen by Baxter. He was now in real danger. He was rushing up the stairs to hide somewhere upstairs when he suddenly found himself surrounded by half a dozen officers from the bank. It became a formal roar. Here's Raffles. Raffles is here. Raffles. 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 They would surely have repeated the word a dozen more times, had it not been for Raffles' sudden blows to the left and right, so that the officers flew like gnats. In the next instant the great unknown flew down a long corridor that stretched out before him. He heard that Baxter ordered that Raffles be delivered dead rather than let him escape. Suddenly, as Lord Lister had nearly reached the end of the hall, a tall, thin figure appeared before him, with a wrinkled face, drooping cheeks, and eyes bulging white. Back. Back. No mortal is allowed through here. Raffles, who now had no time to be polite, held both his fists in front of him like buffers and flew over the man, as it were. In the next moment he had reached a door, but it was closed. Now he was indeed in a bad spot. What are you doing? The man on the ground moaned. Go back soon, very soon. I recommend it to you. I am the director of the bank. All right. That pleases me very much, replied Raffles, taking hold of the man, turning him over, and searching his pockets. He soon found a bunch of keys. Then he ran back to the locked door and had just opened it when Inspector Baxter entered the hall with his men. Raffles locked the door and lit a small electric flashlight. He looked around and saw that he was standing in front of a long staircase that led to a cellar vault. As quickly as the darkness permitted him, he flew down and came into a rather large room, where he looked for a hiding place. He walked forward, but stumbled and fell to the ground. As he felt around, his hand gripped in a soft mass. Startled he sprang up, pressed the lantern and let the light fall on the ground. There lay the horribly mutilated corpse of a man. Almost the moment Raffles made this horrific discovery, Inspector Baxter had an axe brought in to smash the cellar door. It took three minutes for the door to open. 
Suddenly, the officer stopped working. Inspector, have you heard nothing? Indeed. Baxter, too, had heard a shot drop down there. There has been shooting, he whispered. With United Forces the door was now opened, and then a rattling shriek rang out from the men. After that everything was quiet. Baxter stopped for a moment. It's not right down there, he muttered. The officers had also turned pale. They had all heard the rattling of a dying man who had been violently killed. The bank manager, standing with the agents, wiped the clammy sweat from his forehead and whispered. There has been, there has been, a crime, committed. Come on. We need to know the finer points. Baxter ordered and jumped down the stairs, followed by his men. When the electric lamps of the officers illuminated the cellar, they saw a dead man lying in the middle. The bank director let out a cry and tumbled forward, as it were. What, what, is that? But that is, that is, witchcraft. Baxter was kneeling beside the dead man. It was Raffles. Beside him lay a large pool of blood. The fur coat floated in the red liquid. Raffles' hands and face were stained with blood, and it was clearly seen where the hair had been glued that a bullet had entered the head. There was no mistake here. Inspector Baxter looked the dead man in the face. It's Raffles, he said. Well, Inspector, it's Raffles, echoed the officers. It was indeed the great unknown. As far as it could be discerned by the blood, his face was as white as death. The lips were closed, as were the eyes, which had sunk deep into their sockets. Inspector Baxter looked around. Then he slowly took off the uniform cap and said. God be merciful to his poor sinful soul. Amen, said one of the officers. Then he added. There's someone else there, Inspector. Baxter leapt toward the second corpse like a tiger. Indeed. Someone else lay here. One whose face and body was horribly mutilated. At least twenty stabs had hit him. He lay in a corner, and Inspector Baxter examined whether no scrap of paper could give any clue. The director of the bank was speechless, but after a while he gasped with difficulty. You must make a thorough investigation at once, Inspector. That's terrible. Awful. What should be done now? Baxter shook his head. Give us a room, Director, where we can keep the corpses until evening. I'll have them taken away then. One of the officers had meanwhile fetched a doctor. He bent briefly over the dead man, who had been stabbed, and then said. Done. Then he looked at Raffles and said. Done too. A beautiful history. What actually happened here? If I knew that, doctor, I'd give ten years of my life, said the desperate police inspector. I have never witnessed anything like this. The devil himself is at play here. But of course, Raffles is back too. Again he searched the cellar, again he shook his head. Nothing, nothing at all. Here two crimes had been committed, at which the human mind stood still. With the help of the agents, the two bodies were now taken to a room that the bank director had at his disposal. One of the men kept on guard until the bodies were collected. In the evening all the London papers gave the startling report that Raffles, the great unknown, was dead. Only those who had had an unpleasant relationship with Lord Lister rejoiced at the news. But those who owed much to his great kindness shed some tears in his memory. Chapter 2 The Great Unknown is Immortal Raffles lay there on a wooden bench in a back room. Time passed, the clock pointed ten minutes to four, when the bank was closed to the public. The cop, who kept watch, walked impatiently to and fro. Suddenly, when he turned around again, he stood as if transfixed. He opened his mouth to scream, his hair stood on end, his eyes popped out of their sockets, and he stood motionless for a few seconds. One of the two dead had moved. It was Raffles. The agent didn't believe it at first. He looked more closely and, yes, there was Raffles moving again. He leaned his elbow on the couch he was lying on and straightened up halfway. And his great, shining eyes, those eyes of which all were so afraid, because they radiated a supernatural power. They focused large and penetratingly on the agent. That was too much for the Scotland Yard policeman. He let out a loud scream and ran away. Raffles laughed, laughed so loudly that it echoed through the room. Lord Lister rose slowly and walked up and down the room a few times, trying to regain some movement in his stiff limbs. The blood had stiffened and was flowing slowly through his veins. 
he had finally regained his strength. He straightened up, opened the door and stepped out. It was empty in the hallway. The public had gone and only a few officials were still present. In the great hall was only the first bookkeeper who had brought about the arrest of Raffles that day. He was bent over his work when suddenly one of the gullwing doors opened and a blood-stained corpse entered. Well, are you still at work? Raffles asked in a grave voice. At the first words, the bookkeeper from his work had looked up. He looked like a madman and then cried out. For heaven's sake, who are you? I? I am Raffles. Raffles? But aren't you dead? Well, now I'm alive again. But that is not possible, yelled the bookkeeper. And yet it is so, dear sir. No, no. Stay calm. Do not bother. I'll find a place. There is plenty of room in this large hall. How much have you received today? Nothing. Nothing at all, roared the terrified man. That's quite a bit for a branch of the London and Southwest banks. Then he went behind a desk, opened a drawer with one of the principal's keys, and looked inside. All the drums. One hundred, thousand, five thousand, ten thousand, forty thousand pounds. That's a very nice sum, mister. I don't think the bank looks at a twenty thousand pounds. With these words Raffles took twenty thousand pounds from the drawer, put them in the pocket, and said. It's four o'clock now. You mustn't beg before five o'clock, understand? The man remained mute. Did you understand me? Thundered Raffles. You must not peck for an hour. Then you can scream as loud as you like. The bookkeeper nodded. Indeed, it was impossible for him to make any sound. Raffles left the great hall. He walked down the hall and suddenly heard two voices. He took no notice when the words rang in his ear. The Duke of Norfolk's diamonds. He stopped now and listened with his ear leaning against the door from which the sound came. I will take charge of the Duke's diamonds, heard Lord Lister say. Where are they being taken? To the Great Exhibition Building in Regent Street. You must fetch them tonight and bring them back tomorrow. All right. It was quiet for a while now. Lord Lister thought. Then, after he had pondered for ten seconds, he continued down the corridor went to one of the fountains that had been placed here and there for the staff, washed the blood from his face, and left the bank building without being further troubled by anyone. Half an hour later he entered one of his residences. This was located on Street James Street and consisted of an apartment of six rooms. Inside, a door opened and Charlie Brand looked into the hallway. Is it you? As you see. My dear, what fears I have endured for you. No less for you, dear Charlie. He glanced sideways at Raffles and then said. How pale you look, John. Do you care? No, what should I care, fellow? I just experienced something there that won't leave you in your cold clothes. Explain a little more, John. Tell me how all the papers could bring you death tidings. Do you want to read it? Of course, my boy. That interests me immensely. Charlie Brand made it to the Times and handed it to his friend. This one read. London takes a deep breath. Raffles is dead. The great unknown, named Raffles, has today found a sudden death in the eleventh branch of the London and South West Bank. When the officers who pursued him pressed into the cellar to which he had fled, they found his body. A gunshot wound to the head proved how Raffles had met his end. The most puzzling thing about this story is that the weapon with which Raffles was shot has never been found. Near Raffles' corpse lay another corpse, tenet of a hitherto unknown person. No trace of the murderer has yet been discovered either. Excellent. Whispered Raffles. Did it all happen as it stands here? Asked Charlie Brand. Exactly so. But you've been examined, haven't you? How could you keep yourself dead then? But now I see you're hurt too. Your hair is covered with blood above your right temple. Raffles rose, went to the mirror, wiped out the wound he indeed had in this spot, put a large plaster over it, and sat down again. Who hurt you, John? Lord Lister laughed. Who else but myself, stupid fellow? You? And where is the revolver? I threw it through a small barred window into the street. I'll tell you the whole story, Charlie, so you can satisfy your curiosity. I was then chased down to the cellar by friend Baxter, but I had a small head start because I had bolted the door behind me. But there was no way for me to escape. And then suddenly I saw the corpse of a man lying in front of me. 
awful, grumbled Charlie. It was not very pleasant to me either, replied Lord Lister, and my persecutors were shouting upstairs. What to do? There was only one way out, I had to die. You know, Charlie, I always carry a vial filled with a mixture of toxin and morphine. When I spray that liquid under the skin, stiffening follows, which always lasts for a few hours. The doctor did not make the slightest effort to examine my heartbeat, or he would of course have noticed that I was not dead. I gave the complete impression of a dead man, of course. But to settle the story regularly. I dragged the strange corpse, which lay in a great pool of blood, to the other end of the cellar, did the injection, placed the weapon against my temple in such a way that only a minor wound was to follow, pressed off and threw the weapon through the bar window. I had just time to lie down where the dead man had lain. Then I also lost consciousness. You understand that the officers thought I was dead, though I lay not in my own blood, but in that of the unknown man. You see, Charlie, that my ruse has worked perfectly, and that I have fled again from the hands of my mortal enemy Baxter. And Lord Lister picked up the times again. There his eyes fell on the following article. The Jewels of the Duke of Norfolk. The Duke of Norfolk has returned some days ago from his long journey to India, and has betrothed Lady Widemer, the daughter of a pair. We are told that the marriage will be concluded quite soon. It will be one of the greatest ceremonies recently celebrated in London, for both the Duke of Norfolk and Lord Widemer are among the wealthiest families in the country. The diamonds of the Duke of Norfolk are worth not less than two million pounds sterling. Seven of the most beautiful and purest stones the Duke has already bestowed upon his bride. The history of these jewels is very interesting. They formed the main part of the Duke's estate. However, he also owns vast estates in Scotland. For three centuries the Dukes of Norfolk have owned these jewels, eleven which are kept in a vault of the London and South West Bank. There is a will which stipulates that the heir of the ducal house receives the diamonds only upon marriage. After the old Duke of Norfolk died, the diamonds lay in the London and South West Banks for about four years and again and again they were taken to another branch to prevent theft. Only the most senior officials are aware of the hiding place. Also, the jewels must be exhibited every time they change hands. This clause was at that time added to the will by one of the dukes, so that the owner might not sell or pledge the jewels. The youngest duke of Norfolk must also abide by all these precepts. The diamonds will be on display in the new exhibition building in Regent Street from January 17th that is, from tomorrow, until the 25th of this month. Of course, important precautions have been taken to prevent possible theft. These precious jewels have not been exhibited in 30 years, and a large influx of the London public is expected. Lord Lister smiled strangely as he put the paper aside. Have you read it Charlie? Yes. But I don't understand why this is so interesting. I'm much more interested in who that murdered man may be you found in the basement of the bank. Lord Lister shrugged. I think that is someone who is closely associated with the bank. Why do you think? I think so, and the fact that the man was murdered strengthens my suspicion. But now I have to make the necessary preparations to be on time tomorrow. To be on time? But what do you mean? I will guard the diamonds of the Duke of Norfolk, replied Lord Lister. Then he got up and went to write the following note. To the Inspector of Police Baxter, Scotland Yard value Baxter. Although I really have no reason to be grateful to you, I do want to do you a favor. For I advise you to keep a close eye on the director of the 11th branch of the London and South West Bank, for he is a scoundrel. Raffles. Lord Lister folded this letter, sealed it, and sent the attendant to the bus with it. Then he went to his secret desk, which was full of mirrors and where there was a large table with all kinds of makeup and powder. A dozen different beards and wigs hung along the walls. For a long time Lord Lister was figuring out what he needed, for this master thief was not content not to be equal in the smallest detail to the people he wished to imitate. And when he later entered Charlie Brand with a dark pointy beard and dyed brown hair, the latter stood stunned. What did you mean, asked Charlie, that you want to go and guard Lord Norfolk's diamonds? Don't you understand that? Of course you want them in your possession, don't you? Raffles? Perhaps. But let's go now. Would you like to come with me Charlie? Where to? To the eleventh branch. You seem to have a great fondness for that branch, in spite of all that has already happened. Lord Lister did not answer. 
he changed his clothes and went out with Charlie. In the eleventh branch, meanwhile, things had been anything but quiet. The officer had warned Inspector Baxter, and he had come at five o'clock, just as the bookkeeper let out a terrible cry of terror. Baxter burst into the great hall. Is he gone? he asked with trembling knees. Where is he, where is he? I only know that he was here, Inspector. What a terrible fellow. Have you ever experienced a dead man coming back to life? Everything is experienced at Raffles, Baxter exclaimed, the fellow still drives me mad. The building was searched from top to bottom, with of course no trace of Raffles being discovered. Only his fur coat and the blood-stained wash water were found, and Baxter left business again empty-handed. Only the director, who had his official residence in the rear of the building, remained behind. The man went to bed early, having laid out the Duke of Norfolk's diamonds for transfer to the exhibition hall the following day. In the meantime it had become midnight. A sentry walked up and down in front of the bank building. As he withdrew to a side street, two slender men stepped out of the darkness into the light of the lantern. It was Raffles and his friend Charlie. Now Charlie stood with his shoulders against the wall, joined hands, and let Lord Lister step in. The latter stood with a rock on his friend's shoulder and now silently opened a wooden Venetian blind. Charlie Brand walked up and down downstairs with great strides. Fifteen minutes later, Lord Lister came down again. He carried a large cassette under his left arm and laughed, so that Charlie put his finger to his mouth in alarm. They hurried on, and Charlie asked. Why are you having so much fun, John? But Lord Lister had already grown serious again. You will have a miracle tomorrow, Charlie. What? A miracle I tell you. And what do you have in the cassette? The Duke of Norfolk's diamonds. Charlie stood for a moment, stunned. He didn't want to believe it. The, the, diamonds, of the Duke of Norfolk? But, but that's a huge power. Are not you scared? Lord Lister smiled again. Anxious? I? Yes. For whom? And why? But tomorrow, tomorrow the diamonds won't be in the exhibition building. How did you come up with that? The diamonds will be there for sure. Charlie shrugged. I do not understand that. Who should take them there? I. You? You want to take them to the exhibition building? Secure. From now on I am the authorized representative of the bank. But John, what nonsense. Charlie Brand didn't understand what to think of his friend. Tomorrow everything will become clear to you, said Raffles. That night Raffles made another series of preparations. His friend Charlie, however, slept weary from the excitement of the day, and awoke only when the sun was already high in the sky. Raffles, however, had disappeared, and at the same time a rumor was circulating through London that he had been taken into custody. Chapter 3 the secret of the diamonds. It had worked like this. The report, which had appeared in the Times, had not gone unread. In London, the men place the greatest interest in sports, the women in luxury and especially in jewellery. The prospect of seeing the diamonds of the Duke of Norfolk, which were yet to surpass the King's crown diamonds in size, purity, and preciousness, had already drawn a great crowd to the exhibition building early in the morning. At nine o'clock already a great number of ladies and gentlemen were moving through the elegant halls. Equipages rolled up, automobiles whirred ahead. The grooms whirled around and one lady followed the other. They wore her precious winter robes, long fur-trimmed cloaks, broad boas, and other precious fur. The Duke of Norfolk's diamonds were spread on seven large silken cushions. Actually, the opening time of the exhibition was set at ten o'clock. But the trustee of the London Bank had already appeared at half past eight with his precious treasure. The representative was a slender man of about thirty five years of age with a dark pointed beard. He looked very distinguished indeed in his neat lavatory, as he stood behind the great table, without even once looking up from the silk cushions, on which glittered the beautiful stones, diamonds as big as pigeons' eggs, next to rubies and topazes, emeralds, set in gold, next to garnets amethysts next to opals and tourmalines next to cordiorites. But diamonds and emeralds were in the greatest number, and everything glittered and glittered and twinkled on the dark velvet, which was supposed to have before them a part of the firmament, from which glittered stars of the first magnitude. Visitors to the exhibition had not yet entered when a very distinguished young lady entered, 
accompanied by an inspector. She had chestnut hair, which framed her delicate face in dense locks, and two large black eyes were shaded by long lashes. Here, lady, is the exhibition, said the inspector, bowing and leaving, for he was strictly forbidden to remain in the hall even for a minute. The young lady went to the slender gentleman. My name is Miss Marion, she said, I am a female detective and sent here to guard with you the diamonds of the Duke of Norfolk. She had approached, and the train of her precious dress rustled softly on the floor. Without waiting for Mr. Blake's answer, she took off the long gloves from the white hands and sat down behind the table. Then she glanced at the revolver, which lay within the gentleman's reach, and said nothing but. All right. The other smiled now, but didn't say a word. The visitors were now admitted and many police officers lined up with the pair sitting at the table to prevent any attempted theft or confusion. The valuables were admired by all, and many coveted glances of vain women and greedy men were cast upon the precious stones. After half an hour, the hall had to be vacated to let in new visitors. But between the visits of the first and second groups there was a break of half an hour, during which the diamonds were again carefully examined. Mr. Blake's lit a cigarette, having asked the female detective for a permit, blew the smoke before him and asked. Who actually sent you here, lady? Are you interested in that? The Lord Major of London was a little concerned that the officers could not do this work alone, and besides, I am pursuing only one goal. And that is? I want to catch raffles. I come from a noble family, impoverished by all kinds of adversity, and therefore I have chosen a profession which gives a high salary. You are right. And now you're set on catching raffles? I'm interested in him. He impresses me, this gentleman thief, and that is why I would like to try my strength on him. Her eyes gleamed and a smile curled her lips. At the same instant a bell rang and the new visitors were let in. They had scarcely filled the hall when suddenly a gentleman rushed in carrying a black suitcase and knocked over anyone who stood in his way. All eyes turned to this person. The man who entered looked like the gentleman who guarded the diamonds. This wondrous likeness caused a general sensation, which rose not a little when the intruder exclaimed. All devils, what's going on here? I am Mr. Blakes, the representative of the London and South West Bank. No one answered. Finally one of the police officers asked. Can you identify yourself? Secure. And this second Mr. Blakes pulled out his papers. The police officer shrugged. There is, after all, only one Mr. Blakes, he said, and there seems to be some trickery involved here. How did the Duke of Norfolk's diamonds get here, if you're the real Mr. Blakes? He stretched out his arm to the gentleman behind the table and said. That man is Raffles. The confusion that followed these words is indescribable. The gentleman retreated in terror, the ladies shrieked with terror, but most of them crowded around this interesting man, who for many months had kept the whole of London in breathless suspense and every day fed the newspapers with sensational articles. So that was Raffles. This one, however, seemed to disagree at all with Mr. Blake's revelations. You are mad, he exclaimed, and recoiled in terror as he looked closely at his doppelganger. That was indeed the same dark pointed beard, the same eyebrows, the same hair, the same features. That is a horrible deception, he exclaimed, that is baseness. And before anyone could stop it, he had drawn his revolver, fired, the shot went off. But no, it was two shots, whose blast mingled with each other. For, the very moment when the second Mr. Blakes fired the pistol, the man standing next to the female detective had produced the weapon with lightning speed. When the gunpowder vapor had cleared, whoever had entered last was on his knees, his revolver lay half a meter away and a stream of blood flowed from his right hand. Mr. Blakes had shot him through the hand. Shall I tell you again to take that wretch away? ordered the gentleman behind the table in a thunderous voice. This imposter is Raffles, who wants to take advantage of the general confusion to get hold of the Duke of Norfolk's diamonds. It's not true, moaned the other. I have them here, I have them with me the diamonds of the Duke of Norfolk. The public became increasingly tense. They all pressed forward to see what that newcomer had hidden in that trunk. And indeed. In the trunk, carefully fastened to the cushions, lay the diamonds of the Duke of Norfolk. But over there on the table they lay too, and the policemen stroked their eyes to chase away the ghost, which they could not yet believe. There, however, came the voice of Mr. Blakes again, 
who stood behind the table of twinkling jewels. But, sirs are you so short-sighted not to see that the jewels Raffles brings here are all counterfeit. Great sensation. The police inspector now spoke and turned to the bystanders. Are there any among the gentlemen present who know diamonds? Immediately a few gentlemen and ladies presented themselves. An old venerable old man took out a microscope and held it over the diamonds which the second Mr. Blakes had brought. Breathless tension ensued. At last the grey gentleman lifted his head and spoke firmly. These diamonds are false. I have already said so, said the first Mr. Blakes now, and if the policeman now hesitate any longer in taking this arch impostor away, I shall no longer be responsible for the consequences. Those words helped. Half a dozen officers grabbed the mysterious Mr. Blakes and dragged him to the door. This one broke free once more, ran to the other Mr. Blakes, and shouted. Here, here, there, there, he pointed to the precious stones on display, here lie the stolen diamonds of the Duke of Norfolk, stolen last night from the eleventh outbuilding of the London and South West Bank. I have heard of that theft, replied the other Mr. Blakes. The case is like this. Last night when Raffles attempted to steal the genuine diamonds, the false ones fell into his hands, and he had the audacity to show them to the London public today. You see, gentlemen, that Raffles has betrayed himself. So take him away. The second Mr. Blakes was now caught in the collar and taken away. The female detective had been looking at the two gentlemen the whole time. Too bad, she whispered now. Mr. Blakes smiled at her. Why, lady? She sighed deeply. I had imagined Raffles very differently. How? Oh. Slimmer, more elegant, well, I can't say it like that. And I had also dreamed of catching him myself. At the same instant Mr. Blakes picked up the revolver and extended it to an elegant gentleman, who took one of the diamonds. Get out of there, if you don't want a bullet between your ribs. He looked up with a deathly white face and the young lady next to him let out a cry of terror. Are you mad? asked one of the policemen, that is the Duke of Norfolk. Then he mustn't steal his own diamonds, said Raffles, calmly. The Duke of Norfolk, a person of about forty years of age, of an unsympathetic countenance, raised his cane, but Mr. Blakes said very calmly. I am doing my duty, Duke. Put that stick away, for a bullet is faster. The Duke made an angry motion, then withdrew into the back of the hall. Again a half-hour break was taken. You are a remarkable person, said the female detective, as she checked the jewels with Blake's. Why, lady? I believe you have better eyes than anyone in the world. How do you mean that? Because you see through everything. Mr. Blake laughed. That is what I learn in my profession. I wish you such a pair of eyes, lady, then perhaps you would be a very good detective. The girl was not a little angry at this saying. Oh, for that matter. She replied, Don't imagine, Mr. Blakes, that you recognized Raffles. I saw that already when he entered the room. I just didn't want to act hastily. Very well. Egg, egg. And now, of course, you are very sorry that you did not catch him. I cannot deny that. Well, lady, what would you give if there was still a chance of catching Raffles? She looked at him with a mocking smile. You can't give me that chance, can you? Who knows? Now what do I get? A hundred pounds. Bah. I light my cigarette with that. A kiss, lady, if you give it, I'm ready. She turned away. But Blake's was not so easily discouraged, and at last she said. If you can show me that you can help catch Raffles, then, for heaven's sake, I'll kiss you. He stretched out his hand. On my honor and hand, lady? A woman a woman, a word a word. Mr. Blakes. Good. Then take me prisoner. And then to the police officers. The public can come back in. The men came back in. The girl stood still like a statue. The man next to her had just said with the utmost calm that he was Raffles. Burning hot, the blood flew to her cheeks. She looked sideways at Mr. Blakes, and it became more and more clear to her that it was indeed Raffles. I thought, she stuttered, I thought. You had black hair. Had I known, lady, that I was going to meet you, I would certainly have left my beard at home. She blushed. He made fun of her because she hadn't even noticed that his beard was fake. You are a terrible man, 
she whispered, but beware, you won't escape me. I'll have you arrested as soon as you leave the building here. Excellent, lady. But I'll get the kiss first. There one of the detectives came over to the jewel table. He reached out to Blake's and said. It was indeed Raffles. You helped us to a famous catch. The addressee smiled. Thank you. Do you know the latest news yet? And that is? The director of the 11th branch disappeared without a trace last night. Indeed? A new crime seems to have been committed. Raffles coughed once and blew a cloud of blue smoke into the air. Then he asked. May I help you with something, lady? She looked up and saw his smiling face. Oh, how she hated him at this moment. She could have killed him. I should like to know, she whispered, where the actual Mr. Blakes is. That one, lady? Oh, he's dead. Dead? Not murdered after all? Yes. But, for God's sake, not by you, surely? No, lady. I don't do such things. The director of the eleventh branch killed him. Are you sure? Yes, very sure. I saw the crime through the keyhole and wanted to run to the rescue when it was already too late. I suspect the warden wanted to appropriate the Duke's jewels, and then went here disguised as Mr. Blake's. I understood that this would be the case, and it pleased me to trap the murderer. Thus I have put the villain, whom Baxter does not want to arrest, in prison, and in doing so have done a good deed in the interest of humanity, don't you think? She did not answer, and her eyes grew black. How could she master that man? But it had to, it had to. Yes, she wanted to accept the fight to the death. Of course she didn't think at first of calling the officers and having Raffles arrested. No. She would fight him with equal weapons in the same elegant yet cunning way. But how did you get the diamonds into your possession? She asked suddenly, and how did the director come here with the false stones? Isn't that clear to you too, lady? Oh. Oh. That is so very simple. The director was a smart one. He had probably had a whole trunk full of counterfeit stones made for the purpose of displaying them all and appropriating the real ones for himself. When I paid a visit to the director at night, I immediately saw that the diamonds on his table were not real. I am not so easily led astray, lady. I then looked for the real stones and quickly found them in a wall cupboard. There I took the real one from the trunk and replaced it with the fake one. The next morning the box that had contained the false stones was gone, and the director believed that the thieves had fallen into the hands of the false stones. It's a little complicated, isn't it, lady? But the whole thing is, after all, quite simple. She didn't answer. It made her dizzy more and more. Oh, that raffles. That raffles. But she swore revenge on him. By God, he wouldn't escape her. Chapter 4 Guala the plant of forgotten ants. The inspector on duty had informed Mr. Blakes that the director of the head office of the London Bank did not think it advisable to return the jewels every night. They would remain in the exhibition building, closely guarded by fifty men. As evening approached, Lord Lister said to the girl. If it's all right with you, lady, I'll take an hour's break now. I'm going home for supper. She nodded. Good. I'll keep watch until then. No sooner had he left than the girl called on a secret agent. Follow Mr. Blakes all over London and tell me where he lives. All right, lady. The man disappeared. He followed Mr. Blakes, who walked dead calmly, breathing deeply the pungent winter air. It was bitterly cold and thick snow lay on the streets. Lord Lister now entered a telephone office and was connected to Scotland Yard. Inspector Baxter there? Yes? Here Raffles. Well. Keep calm, Inspector, here Raffles. Have you arrested the director of the 11th branch? Don't you? He's a mean fellow. He should be locked up. You don't seem to understand that, Inspector. Of the 11th branch killed Mr. Blakes. Are you satisfied now? What? Don't you believe it? Is Mr. Blakes in the exhibition building? But this isn't Blakes, that's Raffles. What? Won't you be fooled? Is Raffles in prison? You are a madman. Inspector. The one in prison is not Raffles, but the director of the 11th branch. Don't you believe that either? Go and inquire before you contradict me, I've briefed you as fully as I can. Adieu, Inspector Baxter. See you next time. Then Lord Lister went to his home, where he dined most lavishly with Charlie Brand, 
but at the same time showed extraordinary weariness. What have you got? asked Charlie. Raffles smiled. Nothing, nothing at all, fellow. I only believe that I am in love. And then he went back to her the exhibition building. It was eight o'clock in the evening. Outside the winter night had long been over the earth spread out. There came the Duke of Norfolk, accompanied by a beautiful, elegant young lady, whose eyes, however, radiated anything but happiness and peace of mind. She seemed distressed as she stepped into the hall by the arm of the Duke. The latter seemed to have forgotten the incident of that day and, smiling, went to the bank representative. I have seen with great pleasure, said the Duke, that you discharge your duties with great conscientiousness, and therefore I do not blame you for what has happened. Now, however, I would like to see my diamonds. A young man accompanied the engaged couple. The Duke introduced him as his secretary, and Raffles remarked that Lady Widemer, the soon-to-be Duchess, and the young secretary looked at each other with fondly enamoured eyes. Raffles handed over the task of displaying the jewels to the female detective, and went on to exchange a few words with the young man, which aroused a lively interest in him. But before that he whispered to the girl. Don't you notice, lady, that the Duke of Norfolk looks so pale? Usually the people who have lived in the Indies for a long time are a lot browner in skin colour. Now he began a short conversation with the secretary. The lady looked at the Duke, and indeed she noticed his paleness too. He looked more like someone who had kept the room for months on end than someone who had lived under the tropical sun for many years. Excuse me, sir, said Raffles to the secretary, I am addressing you because you wear the same uniform as one I have met under very tragic circumstances. The secretary clutched both of Lord Lister's hands convulsively. What do you say? Have you seen him? Where? Ah, uh, I've been looking for him for many months, he's my father. Lord Lister nodded. I thought so. The man wearing the same uniform was found yesterday in the basement of the 11th branch of the London and South West Bank. I advise you to go to the police to see the body. The young man burst into sobs. For God's sake, that too. That too. And no one knows where our wealth has gone. Did you have to accept this position because you are impoverished? Yes. Vader had his capital at the 11th branch. Suddenly he had disappeared without a trace. When we made inquiries about him, we learned that he had taken up all the capital, no mortal knew what to do with all the money. Since then I have never heard from father again. The matter is quite clear. He has become a victim of the branch director, who must have imprisoned your father for months before he killed him in the cellar. The young lady had turned her head and again looked at the secretary with a telling look. He noticed that Mr. Blakes had noticed that look of understanding. For God's sake, he begged Lord Lister. Don't say anything you have seen. Lord Lister thought for a few moments. I will see to it, he said then, that you are restored to your property, and if you are wise and courageous, you must see that the Duke of Norfolk does not make her his wife whom you love. Then he went back to the jewel table. Aren't you tired, lady? Raffles asked the young girl. She shook her head. My sleep is dispelled by the thought of him who sits beside me. He smiled with satisfaction. So you are afraid of me, lady? Don't be afraid. But I don't understand why you broke into the eleventh branch last night, stole the jewels, and brought them here. Why all this? Do you want to act as a detective? She looked at him angrily. Would you like to steal the Duke's diamonds? Had you thought otherwise, lady? You will not dare. You'll see, lady. Her eyes blazed. I will prevent you, she pulled out a pistol. I'll shoot you on the first try. He smiled again. First, lady, I took the cartridges from the revolver, secondly, you won't notice me stealing the diamonds, and thirdly. He stopped suddenly. In the next instant the whole hall was enveloped in the deepest darkness. Mirror! The girl exclaimed. But then she realized that Raffles couldn't have turned off the light, for he hadn't moved from his place. She had thrown herself upon the diamonds and was determined to defend them with her life, but one hand gripped her throat and pushed her back, while a second hand slid under her arm and groped for the jewels on the pillow. The girl, however, was not easily shaken. She would rather have a knife stuck between her ribs than allow this theft. She grasped the hand with both hands, a shiver ran through her whole body, unable to let go of it. A moment later a shot rang out and the electric light was on again. There was general confusion in the hall, and when the lights came back on, 
The female detective had fallen down beside the couch with a loud cry and lost consciousness. Lord Lister took the thing she held in her hands and flung it in a great arc. It was a dead hand, a hand that had once belonged to a man, and now carefully prepared, the hand of an aristocrat, distinguished and elegant. On the middle finger glittered a great, precious emerald, in which two letters were engraved. Some of the policemen searched for the man who had committed this brutal burglary, and a few others stood on the death hand with desperate faces. Raffles, however, leaned over the pillow, took off the jewels, put them in his pocket, and went away. Outside in the darkness, a troop of police officers led by Baxter met him. It was so dark that one could hardly make out the people. What happened? Baxter asked, mistaking him for a detective in his disguise. There has been a break-in, replied Lord Lister, calmly. That was Raffles. Oh, I'm still going crazy. Raffles and always Raffles. He ran into the hall. Lord Lister withdrew calmly, took a carriage, and rode to the secretary of the Duke of Norfolk. Lord Lister had changed completely when he entered the room of the secretary, who did not recognize him at first. I think you have arranged with Lady Widemer to flee with her before she becomes the Duke of Norfolk's wife. How do you know that? I know everything. But have you also the necessary means to flee? Unfortunately not. Well, here you have the diamonds which the Duke had officially promised to Lady Widemer. They are her property, no one in the world can dispute that, and besides this you have a thousand pounds, which will certainly suffice for the necessities. Lord Lister handed the secretary a wallet and withdrew. The secretary ran after him. That's too much, he exclaimed. You make me the happiest of mortals. How can I ever thank you? Who are you? I am Raffles. Farewell. The moment Lord Lister was about to open the door, he started back. The sound of clattering chains had reached his ear. He looked at the secretary with a questioning look. It is terrible, whispered this one, that repeats itself every night. It is one of the forefathers of the Duke of Norfolk, who can find no rest in his grave. Lord Lister shrugged annoyed. Shaking his head, he left and drove to his home, where Charlie Brand met him in dismay. For God's sake, go back at once or you are lost. Why? Inquire no further, but flee. But tell me why. A lady is here, the famous female detective who wants to arrest you. Lord Lister laughed loudly. And does that frighten you so much, because Lady Marion has come to visit? Charlie looked at his friend unfounded. Lord Lister now ordered his servant to provide a good supper, and then entered the drawing room. A beautiful figure rose from a chair. It was Lady Marion. Lord Lister went to meet her and spoke courteously. I call it a surprise, Lady Marion, and I am pleased that you have responded to my invitation. The girl looked at him with the greatest amazement. Yes, Lady, you sent a detective after me last night to take my address. I didn't want to lead the man astray so as not to miss the pleasure of your visit, and so I invited you. The girl didn't know what to say or do any more. She had wanted to arrest Raffles, but the words stuck in her throat. Finally she released. I have come to recover from you the stolen diamonds of the Duke of Norfolk. Let's talk business later, lady, and let's have supper now. She shook her head. No, Mr. Raffles, I must have the diamonds at once or... Or what? Lady? What will you do against me? What if I hold a cloth of chloroform up to your nose and tie you up, then throw you into the Thames? Have you already thought of that possibility? She turned pale and was silent. Indeed. She was completely in his power. The roles were now divided quite differently from what she had imagined. How could she possibly add raffles now? In the name of the law you are my prisoner. Yet. He hadn't dealt with her yet and he knew not that in an hour Baxter would be here with some policemen. She hadn't been so foolish as to put everything on one card. Raffles did not seem to suspect this, nor did he have the slightest idea that four secret policemen were standing guard outside his house. Now, Lady Marion, he said again, will you not accept my invitation? And he offered her his arm. The girl did not know what to do. She shrugged, took the offered arm, and followed Raffles into the dining room. Full of admiration, her gaze rested on this strange room, in which precious furniture, old porcelain and rare paintings formed a beautiful whole. May I introduce my secretary and friend, lady? 
His name is Charlie. More of his name I cannot betray you, you might meet him later in your profession. Never harm him, lady, for he is a good fellow. Lord Lister himself served the young lady and filled her glass. I don't drink wine, said the girl. Come, Lady Marion, you don't mean that. You think, of course, that I have sprinkled some powder in your glass, but you are mistaken, Lady Marion. I am not at all dangerous and I have never thought of poison. The girl blushed and was ashamed, then she took the glass and drank it. Have you heard anything further, lady? Lord Lister asked suddenly, whether the raffles, arrested by Inspector Baxter in the exhibition building, is still under lock and key? He has been released again, she replied, but later taken back into custody. Inspector Baxter wouldn't believe at first that the director of the 11th branch was a scoundrel, but he's got so much on his mind, and now he's meddling again in the latest London scandal. What is that then? That a certain Mr. Thompson has run off with the Duke of Norfolk's bride. Lord Lister laughed heartily. So? Is that indeed true? You mean the Duke's secretary, don't you? Yes correct. The young man claims to be the son of the man who was murdered by the director of the 11th branch, and so Inspector Baxter has again remanded the director into custody. Now, what next? The director confessed to everything after he had undergone a two-hour interrogation. He killed Mr. Thompson and when the police searched the house, they also found the body of Mr. Blakes. Then the police have finally seized a dastardly villain. I'm only afraid there's another scoundrel in London of whom neither Baxter nor his colleagues have any idea. While the conversation was in full swing, the girl did not notice that Lord Lister suddenly slipped a pinhead-sized grain between her thumb and forefinger. No, she didn't notice. Lord Lister took out his cigarette case. Is it permitted, lady? She nodded and laughed and thought how funny it would be if in half an hour, when Baxter appeared with his little men, she suddenly jumped up and exclaimed, Raffles, I arrest you, in the name of the law. Then suddenly it became as if a black mist was before her eyes. Instinctively the thought came to her, you are poisoned, but then, glancing at Lord Lister, she became calm again. No, he wouldn't be so bad, and she had never heard of him lying to anyone. But now she felt so strange again. Lord Lister's words only dawned on her faintly. She let her arms fall to her sides and slowly closed her eyes. Charlie Brand had seen this change and had jumped up. For God's sake, what have you given her? He asked. She loses consciousness. Lord Lister shook his head. His countenance was very serious. I had to take this remedy, dear Charlie, but it is quite harmless and yet one of the most dangerous weapons I have at my disposal. Is she losing consciousness? No. Have you never heard of the guala, the plant of forgetfulness? Charlie Brand shook his head. It is actually an anesthetic. If used often, it may cause insanity, but otherwise it will only result in amnesia, and... Lord Lister could not finish, for Lady Marion lifted her head. Her eyes sparkled again. She looked around questioningly for a while. Then she asked. Where am I? You are with Lord Boston, lady, have a drink, it will do you good. She drank and looked again at the great unknown. Are you Lord Boston? Yes, lady. She nodded. The conversation continued, but the girl did not seem to remember anything. Raffles took her hand and held it in his for a long time, and as Charlie Brand continued to shake his head from one to the other, Lord Lister spoke to the young girl in a whisper as if he had secrets of state to tell her. Chapter 5 A Night Full of Horror It became so quiet in the dining room that the ticking of the clock could clearly be heard. The Lord was still holding Lady Marion's hand, and Charlie Brand had dozed off when suddenly the valet appeared. Excuse me, Lord, the police are here. Charlie jumped up. Raffles had also stood up and changed color. Law enforcement? He wasn't prepared for that. Where are they? They're just coming up the stairs. I was talking to the kitchen maid when an inspector came to ask if a gentleman lives here who had a lady visiting. The Lord's name was Lord Boston. I was terribly frightened and said. No, inspector. Loud noise was now heard on the stairs. Raffles could not hesitate any longer. It all depended from an instant, and he was already considering which way he might best make it through the flight when suddenly a soft woman's voice whispered in his ear. What is it, Lord Boston? 
What do the police want from you? That it should come right now. The great unknown smiled briefly. Fly out, Charlie, and try to hold them up. And then to Marion. You must save me, the police will be here in a minute, it will cost you a word. She had sprung up and never lost her presence of mind for an instant. What can I do for you? asked Marion, with a loving look, for in the instant she had realized that she could not hand this man over to the police. Go out as soon as possible and pretend you know the inspector. You then tell him to go upstairs and search the servants' rooms. When the police go there, you come into the vestibule, where I will be waiting for you. With a single leap, Lord Lister had disappeared behind a large draft screen the very moment Baxter opened the door and entered. Where is he? Come on, Raffles, don't fight now. His eyes now fell on Lady Marion, the female detective. Ah, are you there, lady? I've already been seriously concerned about you. I see that you have already supped. Now, all the better. Where is he? Lady Marion shrugged. You are astray, Inspector, he is not here. What? Not here? And I thought I saw his shadow through the glass door. He fled through the vestibule up a flight of stairs to a secret passage. Baxter instantly turned and called to the officers. Follow me. Come, Lady Marion, come too. Lady Marion followed the policeman, who went up the stairs, to the servants' quarters. Come, lady, come, cried Inspector Baxter again, but the girl hesitated, for she wished to await the arrival of Lord Boston. She saw a shadow slide along the wall, she turned, and the cry escaped her. Raffles. Guala, the flower of oblivion, had lost its effect, and the female detective remembered everything that had happened. Baxter had mastered that exclamation and turned in a flash, but in the instant Raffles was on his side and slammed the heavy door. The girl wanted to scream and throw herself at Raffles, but Raffles put his hand over her mouth, lifted her up and carried her down the stairs. Ask for the carriage at once. John Raffles called to his friend, as the closed door was pounded with sticks at the top of the stairs, and Inspector Baxter cried out loudly. Lady Marion! Lady Marion! Thou hast lured us into a trap. Shame on you, Lady Marion. Now one can see once again how much one can rely on women. Come on, guys. We must have it. A servant came to say that the carriage was ahead. Raffles still held his hand over the girl's mouth, who defended herself desperately until the forces gave out. As soon as I am gone, said Raffles now to his servant, you can release those people up there and tell them I've brought Lady Marion home. No sooner did the carriage move than the officers who had been stationed outside flew after the carriage, and when Raffles stuck his head out of the door, a bullet whistled through his ears. At the same moment his throat was closed, and a voice whispered. Raffles, you are my prisoner. Raffles removed the fingers from his neck without the slightest effort. I should be sorry, lady, if I had to use any force against you. The carriage stopped with a jolt and Raffles was quite dismayed to discover that his two beautiful stallions had been shot over. Lord Lister jumped out of the carriage and was soon surrounded by a number of detectives. The first who tried to approach him received a tremendous blow under the chin, sending him racing backwards. The second was kicked and the third flew against the crew with such a thud that it knocked the lady over with it in its fall. But the girl was determined to catch Raffles at any cost, and she fired on the officers. When Raffles fled, she rushed after him. Suddenly Raffles stood before the back of a building he had been once before when he had given the diamonds to the Duke of Norfolk's secretary. He did not hesitate for a moment and climbed up the lattice, then he disappeared into the dark garden just at the very moment when his pursuers sought him in vain in the street. In his pace the fugitive ran into a fountain, part of the pedestal fell and Raffles looked into a dark vault. He hesitated for a moment, but then also realized that this was the only way to salvation, and he walked down the corridor. At the end the passage widened into a cavern, which Raffles noticed by the glow of his electric flashlight, and then also wails reached his ear, mingled with the rattle of chains. Clenched his teeth, Raffles strode forward, and then on a straw he saw the emaciated body of a man, all clad in rags. When that person looked at Raffles, he recoiled in terror, and Lord Lister, who would otherwise have been unafraid of being a little one, clenched his teeth so as not to cry out in horror. The unfortunate man missed the right hand and his arm ended in a stump, wrapped in rags. 
The face had retained little of the human character, yet the features were still distinctly recognizable. The resemblance to the Duke of Norfolk, in whose palace Lord Lister resided, was striking. Who was that unfortunate one? Why did he miss the right hand? Was this discovery perhaps related to that dead hand the female detective had held? Who are you? Lord Lister asked the unfortunate. Trust me, I will try to save you. A horrible rattle, was the reply. The wretched one opened his mouth, and with a cry of disgust Raffle stepped back. The man was missing his tongue. And gradually everything became clear to Raffles, as he looked at the left hand of that unfortunate man, the structure of his body, the aristocratic features which the suffering had not erased. This was the real Duke of Norfolk, and the other was a disgraceful, wretched impostor, unparalleled in London. A boundless wrath seized Lord Lister as he gradually began to understand how this unfortunate one was tormented that the other might but as soon as possible come into possession of the priceless diamonds. But Lord Lister would take revenge. He took out a huge knife, and after filing for a long time, the chains clattered to the ground. Then he bade the unfortunate man, by drawing, to follow him. The prisoner did this, crawling on all fours, preceded by Lord Lister, who had his electric flashlight ready. The pair went through many corridors, many doors were broken or broken by Lord Lister, and many rooms they visited. At last they arrived in a fantastically furnished room. A young girl lay on the ground, and a man, with a long dagger in his hand, had put his knee to her throat and stood ready to deliver the deadly thrust. In an instant Raffles had surveyed the whole situation. In horrifying horror he recognized the female detective in the threatened girl and the false Duke of Norfolk in the man. With a scream of rage, Lord Lister threw himself upon him. The savage looked at his new adversary with bloodshot eyes, let go of the girl, and flung himself savagely upon Lord Lister. This one was unarmed, for in the subterranean cave he had left his knives and revolver. The Duke of Norfolk took advantage of this unarmed state of his adversary, and as he tried to fend him off with his left arm, at the same time gave him such a mighty kick in the abdomen that Lord Lister nearly fell to the ground. Then he thrust at him with his knife. With a deft movement, however, Lord Lister had moved out of the way, so that the weapon split the air and fell into the wainscoting of the wall against which Lord Lister was leaning. In the next instant he had the arm of his seized the enemy and crushed it down with the tremendous strength at his disposal. Again his enemy rushed at him, and this way of fighting was all the more dangerous, as Lord Lister had never used it. But the villain, on the other hand, was again unfamiliar with the manner of fighting in which Lord Lister was a master. For as the other raised his right arm to thrust the weapon into Lord Lister's chest, Lord Lister's left arm slid with lightning speed between the back and both arms of his enemy. Now, of course, it was impossible for the villain to strike with his right arm. At the same time, Lord Lister's right hand clasped the left arm of his enemy. His own left arm now lay like a stone between the back and the two arms of his adversary, who had been made impossible to make the slightest movement. He did try, raging furiously, to free himself, but before he could break free, Lord Lister had struck him three times in the throat with the flat of his hand, sending the attacker plop down like a sackcloth. Lord Lister threw himself upon him and bound him before the wretch could regain his senses. Then he jumped up. Panting, himself quite seriously injured, he stood in front of the female detective. For the first time in his life, Lord Lister was so weak that a child could have overcome him. The terrible events of the night had exhausted his strength, and the frantic struggle with this wretch had consumed the last bit of his resistance. And if Lady Marion had now taken her revolver and exclaimed with a menacing gesture, Hands high, Raffles, you are my prisoner. Then Lord Lister would not have found the strength to defend himself against this new foe. His clothes hung in shreds along his side, his knees trembled, and with his right hand he gripped the back of his chair. But the girl no longer thought of arresting him. She was a woman, after all, and since the moment she had met Raffles, two forces had been vying for preeminence in her. The pride and the love. Up to this moment she had refused to admit that this man was her master. She had put all her pride in arresting him, him whom no man had yet grasped, and yet, from the first moment, love had crept into her heart. And now, with Raffles standing defenseless before her, now that love, too, triumphed for the first time. Yes, all hate was gone. She would have been able at this moment to sacrifice her life for him, 
and she turned deathly pale when the house suddenly shook with a terrible noise. Axes were heard beating, doors shattered, shots cracked, and the wailing of mortally wounded servants filled the whole house. The female detective had immediately turned her attention to the palace of the Duke of Norfolk when Rathles had escaped her. She was convinced that he was hiding somewhere here, and had turned to the Duke of Norfolk at night to have the house searched. The Duke, however, who himself desired nothing more fervently than to have Raffles put on his neck, had misunderstood the female detective's visit. He, who was day and night in the most terrible fears that his crime should come to light, thought he had already discovered himself, had therefore let the detectives of the lady be taken by surprise by his servants, and was on the point of killing the lady herself, always diffuse when Lord Lister had appeared at the right moment. One of the detectives who had accompanied the lady had escaped and told the police of the fight that had taken place. Inspector Baxter, who had meanwhile arrived at Scotland Yard with his detectives, had immediately set out, and it was he who now smashed the doors with his men and ransacked the whole house in search of the female detective. She cringed. She listened for a few moments, then laid her hand on the master thief's arm. You are lost in two minutes, she whispered, I will save you. Lord Lister gathered all his strength. The loss of blood, caused by various wounds, weakened him even more. But now, with danger looming, the old energy resurfaced. This man who had an iron constitution did not give up yet. He straightened up and followed the lady, who walked hastily. She herself, however, was not sufficiently acquainted with all the various rooms of the palace to know where to take Lord Lister. She only wished to bring him out of the pernicious vicinity of the detectives, who were just breaking the last doors and now bursting into the room where the terrible battle had just taken place. Meanwhile Lord Lister had reached one of the last rooms of the house. He saw a large closet there, opened it, and took out a precious fur coat. I can hardly go out into the street in this suit, ma'am, he said, laughing, and donning the precious fur. Now he also saw in an adjoining room a large iron safe. I've forgotten my money, lady, he said, with the old humor, which once again lit his eyes with triumphant brilliance, and without money raffles is a zero. He took out his iron drill and opened the cupboard. The female detective, however, put both hands on his arm and said, For God's sake, if you tarry a second, you are lost. At the same instant the safe flew open. Lord Lister took out the contents and pocketed the notes. This happened just as Baxter and his men were about to enter the room separated by only two feeble doors from the one in which Raffles was. He was lost. But now also a helper showed up, which neither he nor the female detective had thought of. From one corner crept a hideous figure, which in the dim twilight of a red lantern looked even more repulsive than before, that half-human half-animal shone and stretched, its emaciated arms raised. Like a protector, the figure placed itself at the door behind which Lord Lister had disappeared. The unfortunate, who had sighed in chains for months, had enough sense to understand that whoever had saved him that night was on the run. And he showed his gratitude by covering Lord Lister's flight with his life. Inspector Baxter and his men were shocked backwards when they discovered that hideous figure. It was as if a corpse had suddenly come alive. Those half-dried eyes, glowing with madness, frightened and dismayed the detectives. They all refused to chase the dreadful form they took for some phantom apparition from the door there, and it was not until many minutes had passed in chilling silence that Inspector Baxter himself found the courage to bite that unfortunate stout, grab it and swing it aside. Then the inspector flew through all the rooms, and just when he had reached the last, the rear, he saw a dark figure disappear like an arrow from the bow through the window and let it slide down. It was Lord Lister who disappeared silently into the dark night. Baxter had recognized him very well. He immediately sent the refugee a shot of gunpowder. Then, sniffing, panting, coughing with rage, he turned to the female detective. The devil can get you, he bellowed, and that's what a detective wants to be. The girl smiled. Then she shook her head. It was me, Inspector. How, what, am I understanding correctly? You do that. Say it again, if you dare. I dare. Say it. I was a detective, Inspector, but now. Now? Now I have become a woman. Inspector Baxter looked at her for a few moments. He was convinced that this girl had lost her mind, and he turned away with a shrug. 
I don't understand that. He grumbled, and then he prepared to pursue Lord Lister, who could no longer be overtaken. The scoundrel, arrested by Raffles, was transferred to Scotland Yard that very night. There he also confessed, when confronted by his wretched victim, that he had behaved inhumanely. In India he had spent seven years in the penitentiary at Madras, and had then been taken on as his private secretary by the Duke of Norfolk, who knew nothing of his past. He was quite like the Duke, and this fateful resemblance had very soon benefited the villain. He had captured his master and then played his part with exquisite villainy. The actual Duke of Norfolk died two days later. His diamonds have now become the property of his family. And Raffles? Ah, he knew well that the beautiful girl, the lovely Miss Marion, had helped him when he was too weak, too exhausted to face any resistance. But he was not surprised, the elegant young lord, for he knew all too well that his influence on women was unspeakable. That they would go through fire for him if he smiled, would sacrifice her life, if he begged for it with his sweetest laugh, his most flattering voice. He had escaped again, the master thief, escaped for the umpteenth time the grasping fingers of the police and he equipped himself for new deeds. The next part will contain Sunken Treasures The End Thank you for listening to today's episode I really hoped you enjoyed it. There will be more to come, please subscribe not to miss out on what is next. I will be looking forward to your return. The music is by Madfan from Pixabay. To support this and other artists go to pixabay.com. Sheila